This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. If you click on the link in the description below, it'll take you to their store and they'll know I sent you there. Hello everyone, I'm Neat Tahone, and today we're continuing with our Ikoria Lair of Behemoths limited review. Today we're looking at red. I've already looked at all the white, blue, and black cards in the set. Tomorrow I'll be continuing with green, and I have a bunch more Ikoria Lair of Behemoths limited content coming out, including draft videos and things like that in the coming weeks. So in this video, I'm going to talk about every red card in the set and how good I think they'll be in the upcoming Aquaria Lair of Behemoths limited format. I'm not talking about any other formats, just draft and sealed. I'm not talking about any constructed formats, so keep that in mind. I'm also only talking about cards that are in booster packs, so cards that are in special products aren't going to be talked about here. Also, I use a letter grade system to sort of sum up what I think about each of the cards in these videos. If you're not sure what my letter grade system means, you can see it described in the description below. All right, let's look at our first red card in Aquaria, Layer of Behemoths, which is Blazing Volley. For one red mana, Blazing Volley is a sorcery at common, and it deals one damage to each creature your opponents control. This is mostly a sideboard card against opponents who have lots of X1s. Sure, sometimes you'll be able to manufacture some value out of it, like after combat, but the fact that this is a sorcery means you can only do it on your turn, and that means a window where it actually does something is less likely to open. I think this is a D- at best in your main deck, and probably a C- out of your sideboard. Next up, it's Blister Spit Gremlin, which for one red mana is a 1-1 common gremlin. You can pay one generic and tap it to deal one damage to each opponent, and whenever you cast a non-creature spell, you can tap Blister Spit Gremlin. Well, it isn't quite Thermo Alchemist, but this is a solid little payoff for blue-red spells matter decks. A one mana 1-1 one -one who can do one to the opponent every turn, even if he does ask you for mana, is probably at least a C-. minus. It provides you with some real inevitability. So I think this is worth playing even in decks that don't really get there on non-creature spells. It is a little better in a deck that does, getting itself up to a C at least. Asking you to pay one mana for that ability is a little bit of a problem, because it means that you have to have one mana left over every time you cast a spell to actually get to damage your opponent, and that just isn't guaranteed. I'm giving this a C. Next up, it's Blitz of the Thunder Raptor, which for one generic and a red is an uncommon instant, and it deals damage to target creature or planeswalker equal to the number of instant and sorcery cards in your graveyard. If that creature or planeswalker would die this turn, exile it instead. So, you probably need at least two instants and or sorceries in your graveyard for this to feel like it is worth it, and once you get three or more, you're really going to be in business. The fact that exile stuff isn't going to be huge in this format, but it will matter sometimes, so the problem with a card like this is usually that it's effectively blank, or almost blank for much of the early game, and that can be a problem. I also think you really need to be a spell-heavy deck to really take advantage of it, because those decks will make it stop being a blank card more consistently and make it do more damage more frequently. I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that red decks will have the necessary seven or so instants and sorceries to make Blitz of the Thunder Raptor make sense, and I think that your average deck that probably has three to five instants and sorceries will probably only be getting like a D out of this. In a deck that really gets there on instants and sorceries, this will become a highly efficient removal spell relatively quickly, and in those cases, it's going to be a B-. Because it has such a high ceiling, it is a card that you can take early and speculate on and hope you can make it work. Next up, it's Cathartic Reunion, which for one generic and a red is a common sorcery. As an additional cost to cast it, you discard two cards and you draw three cards. This is a reprint, and one that would be better in a set that has more of a graveyard theme, like, you know, Theros. In this set, it's mostly just a fine 23rd card, like Tormenting a Voice effects usually are. It's a nice way to dig deeper into your deck, even if you have to do some considerable setup cost in discarding two cards. I think you will probably cut this more than you play it, I'm giving it a D+. Next up, it's Clash of Titans, which for three generic and two red mana is an uncommon instant, and it says target creature fights another target creature. This kind of fight effect is always interesting. Note, you don't have to have one of the creatures who is fighting be your creature. You can make two of your opponent's creatures fight each other. That means you can get a two for one out of it in some ideal scenarios, and even when you don't quite get the ideal scenario, you can still use your big creature to kill their smaller creature. It is an instant though, so finding that ideal window isn't exactly far-fetched. We saw a similar card a few years ago, Dissension in the Ranks, and it ended up being a dud, 
But it was too narrow. It could only make blocking creatures fight each other. If you make two of your opponent's creatures fight each other, you also mitigate against the risk of getting two for one, since no matter what, they end up getting two for one, assuming the creatures are the right size. So, yeah, this is a little situational. I think good enough that I'm willing to say I want to first pick this sometimes. I'm giving it a B-. Next up, it's Cloud Piercer, who for 4 generic and a red is a 5-4 dinosaur at common. He's got Mutate for 3 generic and a red. That means you can cast it for this alternate cost and put it over or under target non-human creature you own. They mutate into the creature on top, plus all abilities from under it. It's got Reach, and when it mutates, you Rummage. In other words, you discard a card and then draw a card. And it's a May effect, by the way, so that's kind of nice. A 5-mana five 5-4 five with Reach is probably pretty close to a solid C. This is also nice because it's nice to put on top of any sort of mutation because it has some beefy stats, and that means if the creature you're mutating it onto has any um, keyword abilities like flying or whatever, they're going to be extra good. Still, I think this is just a solid red common. I'm giving it a C. Next up, it's Dranith Stinger, who for one generic and a red is a human wizard at common. And whenever you cycle another card, it deals one damage to each opponent. This is a 2-mana two 2-2 two two with some nice cycling upside. In the early game, you can just play it to have a bear that might do an extra damage or two with its cycling trigger. Then in the late game, when a 2-mana two 2-2 two two with this ability doesn't seem especially useful, you can cycle it away to try to find what you really need and to trigger all your other cycling payoffs. That makes for a solid red common. I'm giving this a C. I could see myself being wrong here, especially if you get multiples of these, and it's incredibly easy to shove a bunch of cycling into your deck. That may end up being a pretty legitimate win condition, but yeah, I'm going to start it at C for now. Next, it's Everquill Phoenix, which for 2 generic and 2 red is a rare Phoenix. It's a 4-4, it has Mutate of 3 generic and a red. It has Flying, and whenever it mutates, you create a red artifact token named Feather with... Pay one mana, sacrifice feather, return target phoenix card from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. A four mana 4-4 four four with flying on its own is usually a B. That's your fail case here, really. The upside is that you can mutate it and make sure you can get your phoenix back most of the time, in addition to changing a creature on the board into a 4-4 four four flyer or giving a big creature flying. Worth noting that the effect is actually a tribal one. It looks at the creature type of your creature, but Everquill Phoenix is the only phoenix in the set, so it's not going to come up. Could be interesting in some other formats, though. But yeah, this is a bomb. I'm giving it an A-. Next up, it's Ferocious Tigerilla, which for three generic and a red is a 4-3 Cat Ape at common, and it enters the battlefield with your choice of a Trample Counter or a Menace Counter. I think this is the best of this cycle of creatures who come into play and let you choose between two different counters. A 4-mana four 4-3 four, Trampler is probably a C, and a 4-mana four 4-3 four, Menace is probably a C+, and you have the flexibility to choose whichever is best at the time you cast it. One cool thing about this card, too, is that it can slide into either the Red-Green Trample deck or the Black-Red Menace deck, both of which will be able to take advantage of their respective keyword. Overall, I think the flexibility it has and the synergy it has makes this a pretty darn nice 4-drop, especially at common, for most red decks. I'm giving it a C+. Next up, it's Fire Prophecy, which for one generic and a red is a common instant, and it deals three damage to target creature. You may put a card from your hand on the bottom of your library. If you do, draw a card. This is nice removal. Two mana for three damage to a creature at instant speed is usually premium, a B- minus or so, because it tends to be efficient enough to trade up pretty often. But adding this card selection ability, which is something we haven't seen red do in a while, is pretty interesting. It will play much like Rummaging would, except that you don't get the card in the graveyard, so sometimes it will be weaker than Rummaging, but most of the time, you wouldn't know the difference. This is definitely premium removal, kills something, and then helps you find more gas, and I love that. I'm giving it a B. Next up, it's Flame Spill, which for two generic and a red is an uncommon instant, and it deals four damage to target creature. Excess damage is dealt to that creature's controller instead. Back-to-back -back really good premium red removal spells. Three mana for four damage at instant speed is usually good enough for a B- minus at the very least, and the additional value this gives you is nice, as you can use it to do some damage to your opponent too. And sometimes killing their X1 and doing three to them will just be game over. Don't get me wrong, most of the time you should kill something bigger, but if the spillover damage here is going to be lethal for your opponent, well, obviously you should do that. This is another premium red removal spell and another B. Next up, it's Footfall Crater, which for one red mana is an uncommon aura. It has Enchant Land, and Enchanted Land has Tap, target creature gains Trample and Haste until end of turn. This is pretty interesting. How good is giving something Haste or Trample every turn? 
My instinct is that it's probably good enough to be worth a card, assuming your deck has some nice big boys especially. Turning your creatures into charging monstrosaurs is definitely intriguing. I think some people will see this and think about how they can give a creature haste and trample every single turn, even their 2-drop, but it won't really work that way, since the land has to tap to use the ability, and that is a real downside. It means that the crater won't be doing much in the early going of most games, and I don't think you can really count on it always doing something late either, but of course this has cycling, and in situations where casting it doesn't seem to do much, you can always pitch it. I think that ramp decks and aggro decks will be somewhat interested in this, but without cycling, I think this would not be very good. With it, well, I still don't think it's good, but I do think it is in the lower range of being something you will play without feeling too bad about it. I'm giving it a C-. Next up, it's Forbidden Friendship, which for one generic and a red is a common sorcery that makes a 1-1 red dinosaur creature token with haste and a 1-1 human soldier creature token. This is a reasonable deal for two bodies and will help decks that want to go wide. It is a mostly better Krinko's Command, since this dinosaur gets to have haste, and that card is always just fine. Worth noting, too, that there is a cycle of cards in this set that give you extra value if you control both a non-human and a human, and this card can do that single-handedly. This is a solid card, but not a whole lot more than that. It's a fine two-drop to have. I'm giving it a C. Next up, it's Frenzied Raptor, which for two and a red is a 4-2 dinosaur at common. This is kind of an underwhelming reprint, but a nice thing to give Menace and stuff like that to. You'll play this a little more often than you won't. 3 mana for a 4-2 is pretty reasonable, and you can allow it to trade fairly well in addition to being good at gaining keyword counters, giving it a C-. Next up, it's Frill Scare Mentor, which for 2 generic and a red is a 3-2 human warrior at uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, you put a menace counter on target non-human creature you control, and you can pay 2 generic and a black and tap it to put a plus and plus 1 counter on each creature you control with menace. This cycle is nice. Uh, giving a nice keyword like menace to something and then being able to pump that creature in the late game when you have the mana to do it, which becomes even sillier when you have more menace creatures, is pretty great. Worth noting too, the black-red archetype is all about menace, and there's a fair bit of menace in this set, so being able to pump multiple creatures with that ability is not a pipe dream or something like that. It's just going to happen. Plus, this is the most efficient of these cards in this cycle because it's also a 3-mana three 3-2, three which is a pretty good deal since it's also giving you a powerful keyword ability that's evasive and giving you a late-game mana sink. I think all of that makes this a reasonable first pick in some weaker packs, and certainly something you take pretty early. I'm giving Frill Scale Mantor a B-. Next, it's Go for Blood, which for one generic and a red is a common sorcery, and it says target creature you control fights target creature you don't control, and it has cycling for one generic mana. So a two-mana fight spell with no other effect is not exactly exciting. Even when we have seen Prey Upon, a one-mana fight effect we've seen in green from time to time, it hasn't been that impressive. The best fight spells give some sort of boost so that more of the creatures in your deck are capable of fighting and surviving doing it. This doesn't do that, so you have to count on having creatures with good stats in play in most cases. Then, of course, it comes with the very real risk of a two-for-one if your opponent can respond to it. Adding cycling to the mix is nice. It means that in the situations where you have no good ways to fight with it, you can just pitch it, and that helps. But this is still nowhere close to being premium removal or something you want to grab early. I'm giving it a C. There is a caveat here. This set is filled with big boys, and if there are enough of those, maybe this gets better, but I'm going to start it at a C. Next up, it's Heightened Reflexes, which for one red mana is a common instant, and it says target creature gets plus one plus zero until end of turn. Put a first strike counter on it. This is a strictly better Kindled Fury, a trick that usually makes the cut more than half the time in aggressive decks and limited. Plus one plus zero and first strike together makes a lot of creatures win combat, and that's pretty nice for only one red mana, especially because the boost here is permanent, at least the first strike is. I think you're getting a lot for the investment here, which makes this a trick I'm interested in running the first copy of in most red decks. I'm giving it a C. Next up, it's Lava Serpent, who for 5 generic and a red is a 5-5 elemental serpent at common. It has haste and cycling too. I like this. A 6 mana 5-5 with haste is at least a C. It can bring damage out of nowhere, and it can just be a good finisher sometimes. Anytime they give you a card that is both a solid finisher and it has cycling, it's really nice and limited. Because 6 mana is a lot, and if you get this early, you can just cycle it away. Then, if you get it late, it can come down and be the big guy you need. I think this is one of Red's better commons. I'm giving it a C+. 
Next up, it's Luca, Copper Coat Outcast, who for three generic and two red is a legendary planeswalker Luca at Mythic Rare, and he has five loyalty. His plus one says, exile the top three cards of your library. Creature cards exiled this way gain. You may cast this card from exile as long as you control a Luca Planeswalker. His minus two says, exile target creature you control, then reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a creature card with higher converted mana cost. Put that card onto the battlefield on the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. And his ultimate costs seven loyalty, and it says each creature you control deals damage equal to its power to each opponent. Luca seems pretty good to me. His plus one grants you card advantage and in a way also helps you find ways to protect him. Granted, the turn you play him, you most likely won't be able to cast one of the cards you exiled that turn since he costs five mana, but the potential card advantage he can grant you, even in a typical limited deck with 15 or so creatures, is pretty awesome and can definitely take over games. His minus two is nice too, and theoretically you could use it when he comes down in an effort to find a bigger creature who can do a better job of keeping him alive. And his minus seven isn't super exciting all the time, but it can definitely end games and you can get to it quickly. Basically, if you play Luca and get to untap and then use his plus one a second time, you are going to be in business. He will have a moment of vulnerability the turn you play him most of the time, but after that, it's going to be hard for your opponent to ever take him down. I think he's a bomb that you can take with the first pick basically every time you see him, giving him an A. Next up, it's Momentum Rumbler, which for three generic and a red is a 3-3 dinosaur at uncommon. When it attacks, if it doesn't have first strike, put a first strike counter on it. Whenever Momentum Rumbler attacks, if it has first strike, it gains double strike until end of turn. A 4-mana 3-3 that gains first strike when it attacks is already a card that would be worth playing, probably a C at least, but this is way more than that. First of all, it gains first strike permanently once you attack with it, and second of all, after that first swing, it starts gaining double strike. This is an interesting card on its own, but it might also be nice to mutate with. If you put something bigger on top of it that will have double strike every time it attacks, it's going to feel pretty good. If you put something under it to give it more evasive abilities, that feels good too. This seems like a nice uncommon for most red decks, however it is worth noting, there will be some board states where you play this and it just can't attack, and it can't gain first strike, and then you're just looking at a hill giant which won't feel so great. Still, I think the upside is easy enough to take advantage of here, especially in a set with Mutate, so I think this is first pickable in some weaker packs, I'm giving it a B-. Next up, it's Mythos of Vadrock, which for two generic and two red mana is a rare sorcery, and it deals five damage divided as you choose among any number of target creatures and or planeswalkers, and if you pay white and blue to cast it, until your next turn, those permanents can't attack or block, and their activated abilities can't be activated. So a four mana sorcery that divides five damage is already something I'm very much in on. Sure, it can hit players, but I don't care. This is an effect that isn't too hard to get a two for one out of, and sometimes you can do even better than that. Then, if you're Jeskai, you get a nice additional effect, one that will probably lead to you using the card differently. Instead of killing stuff, you'll probably just make it so five things can't attack or block, since that is often just going to be lethal depending on the board state. So, either mode of this card is really powerful, even if going the Jeskai route isn't super easy. I think this is a B+, and an early pick for sure, and certainly premium removal. Obviously, if you can get the Jeskai upside, it probably moves into the lower A range. Next up, it's Porky Parrot, which for three generic and a red is a 3-4 bird beast at Uncommon and has Mutate for two generic and a red, and you can tap it and it deals X damage to any target where X is the number of times this creature has mutated. So a 4-mana 3-4 is probably a D-plus these days, so how much is the Mutate upside worth here? I think a fair bit. Mutating this onto your two drops and turning it into a pinger sounds pretty nice, and yeah, this is part of the cycle of mutate creatures that really pays you off for going tall with mutate, but that seems pretty dangerous here. Though, the idea of being able to do two plus damage to things with the ability is pretty awesome. Still, I have a hard time being super high in any of the mutate creatures who don't mitigate against the two for one for you. This can kind of do it if you pick off some one ones, but that still won't feel amazing or anything. I think this is nice for red decks, but not really first pickable. I'm giving it a C+. Next up, it's Prickly Marmoset, which for two generic and a red is a 2-3 monkey at common. It has first strike, and whenever you cycle a card, it gets plus two, plus zero until end of turn. This is a really nice cycling payoff for a common. A three mana 2-3 with first strike is already a C or so. It's something that blocks and attacks very effectively all game long, thanks to that keyword ability. But then, if you were up against one of these, you have to contend with the fact that it could quickly boost its power, at which point, 
blocking it becomes incredibly difficult. A 4-3 with First Strike will just kill most creatures in combat, and sometimes it will get even bigger than that. I think this is going to be really good in a deck loaded up with cycling, so much so that I want to give it a build around grade. I think it's going to be a C in your typical red deck in this format, and a B- in a deck that gets there on cycling. That means it's a card you can take kind of early, and kind of hope you can make the cycling payoff work for you. Next up, it's Pyroceratops, which for 3 generic and a red is a 2-3 elemental dinosaur at common. It has trample, and whenever you cast a non-creature spell, you put a plus and plus one counter on it. This is basically the same card as Pyrehound, but the Hound has a different creature type. The Hound ended up being a great build around in Shadows over Innistrad, and I think that's what we're looking at here too. A 4 mana 2-3 with Trample is not good, and if your deck only has the usual 3-5 to non-creature spells, you probably shouldn't run Pyroceratops. It's probably an F there. However, if you get there on a spells deck, like you're running 8 or more non-creature spells, this will turn into a very frightening win condition that you can pump at instant speed in some cases, and your opponent has to respect that or risk getting blown out. Unlike Pyrehound, Pyroceratops also exists in a set with Mutate, and mutating on top of the Pyroceratops is a pretty attractive option, since whatever creature you end up with will have the powerful text box of the Pyroceratops, as well as the plus and plus one counters that is already amassed, in addition to probably getting a lot larger and bringing more abilities to the table. All of this makes Pyroceratops a card you should value highly when you are in a spells deck, but keep in mind it has a pretty dismal floor too. I'm going to say that it can go as high as a B in a blue-red spells deck. Next up, it's Raking Claws, which for one generic and a red is a common instant, and it says target creature gains double strike until end of turn, cycling for two mana. I don't like this trick a whole lot. Double strike is a keyword that is ultra-dependent on your creature already being kind of good. It isn't capable of turning any creature into one that can win combat and survive, not even close. Now, it also has the upside of potentially hitting your opponent for lethal out of nowhere, and if you use it with a trampler, like the dinosaur Pyrohound, it can be particularly nasty. Kind of a build-your-own teamer battle rage, but those things won't line up often enough for me to be all that interested. Adding cycling does make it a little better, since when it does nothing, you can just get rid of it and try your next card, but I still don't want to go above D+, here. Next, it's Reptilian Reflection, which for two generic and a red is an uncommon enchantment, and it says whenever you cycle a card, you may have Reptilian Reflection become a 5-4 dinosaur creature with trample and haste, in addition to its other types until end of turn. Obviously, this is a build around. While cycling is certainly abundant in this set, just having like 5 cards with cycling is probably not enough to be running this. You need for it to become a 5-4 at least a couple of times to be worth the mana, and if you don't have enough cycling, there's a real chance that you paid 3 mana for something that will do nothing. I'm gonna say it's like a D- in your typical deck. Most decks probably have enough cycling for it not to be a straight F, but it's close. As far as cycling payoffs go, it does seem like a solid one, but you really have to get there on cycling with this one because its entire value is tied to it. It doesn't do a thing without it. I think it's a C plus in decks that can cycle enough. Next up, it's Rooting Moloch, who for 4 generic and a red is a 4-4 lizard at uncommon, and whenever it enters the battlefield, you exile target card with a cycling ability from your graveyard. Until the end of your next turn, you may play that card, and it has cycling for 2 mana. This guy's sweet, and an interesting design to give red a recursion type effect. If you can consistently have this be a 5 mana 4-4 that effectively draws you a card, you're going to be pretty happy about it. Sure, you have to play that card before the end of your next turn or lose it, but that's fine. It's still very real card advantage that can give you a 2 for 1, and it's attached to a reasonably large creature. It even has cycling itself, in case you'd rather do that. I think this is first pickable in some packs. Getting cycling cards into your graveyard is almost a foregone conclusion in this set, giving it a B-. Next up, it's Rumbling Rock Slide, which for 3 generic and a rare is a common sorcery, and it deals damage to target creature, equal to the number of lands you control. We haven't seen this exact card before, but we've seen plenty of similar ones. The upside about removal based on the number of lands you control is that it scales all game long, and by the late game can often kill just about anything. The downside here is that it's a sorcery, and it costs 4 mana, so in the earlier stages of the game you're not getting a great deal. Still, this is removal, and while it isn't great early, it does the job. It is not what I would call premium, though, between the high cost and the mediocre mana-to-damage ratio in the earlier part of the game. I'm giving it a C+. 
Next, it's Sanctuary Smasher, which for four generic and two red is a 6-4 Rhino Beast at Uncommon. It has First Strike, and it has Cycling for two generic and a red, and when you cycle it, you put a First Strike counter on target creature you control. This whole cycle is nice, but this might be the best card in it. A 6-mana six 6-4 six with First Strike is already a pretty nice creature in Limited. It's hard for your opponents to set up advantageous blocks on this, and even if you're behind, First Strike actually allows this thing to block pretty effectively too. Then you add the Cycling ability, which even if it did nothing else, would be a nice thing to add to this creature, since you could get rid of it if you were desperate for a land drop and nowhere near 6 mana, but this Cycling ability actually does something, and it's something that can effectively alter combat. Giving First Strike to something at instant speed is nice, especially when it's attached to a creature who can be a scary attacker in the late game. So, yeah, I think this is a pretty awesome card and definitely worth the first pick. I think it's a B. Next up, it's Shredded Sails, which for one generic and a red is a common instant, and it says choose one, destroy target artifact, or it deals four damage to target creature with flying, and it has cycling for two. I like the modality this has. It has two very sideboardy effects. You won't always have an artifact or a creature with flying to hit with it, but between both being on this card, you have a decent chance of your opponent having a few targets. On top of that, it has cycling, so if you end up with some sweet cycling payoffs, it's even more likely to be useful for your deck. I think the three options this gives you is enough for you to feel fine-ish about running one of these in your main deck. It is probably still ideal out of the sideboard in most decks, but it is nice that it's fine in the main deck. I'm giving it a C- as a main deck card, and let's say a C- plus as a sideboard card. Next up, it's Spell Eater Wolverine, who for two generic and a red is a 3-2 Wolverine at common, and it has double strike as long as there are three or more instant and or sorcery cards in your graveyard. This is another nice spells payoff. This one has a semi-reasonable floor as a 3-mana three 3-2, three when this thing can gain double strike, it will be pretty formidable, but I don't envision it being all that easy to have three instant and or sorcery cards in your graveyard by turn four or so when it's first attacking. Still, by the later part of the game, having double strike on a three mana 3-2 three is very impressive. Even with a reasonable floor, I think this needs a build around grade just because the majority of decks won't be able to give this thing double strike. I think it is a D plus in most decks in this format, where it's just a 3 mana 3-2 three who might really rarely gain double strike, but it's a C plus in a spells deck. It is also not a bad thing to mutate onto in your spell deck, since giving double strike to a mutated creature can be pretty scary. Next up, it's Tentative Connection, which for 3 generic and a red is a common sorcery, and it says this spell costs 3 less to cast if you control a creature with menace. And you gain control of target creature until end of turn, untap that creature, and it gains haste until end of turn. This is pretty interesting. Threaten effects often aren't worth it in limited, especially when they cost 4 mana. This is because stealing one of their creatures is usually pretty situational. Doing it is usually only worth it if your opponent dies from it, so these tend to sit in your hand. But this one always costs 4, and sometimes it will only cost 1 red. There are lots of creatures with Menace in this set. The Black Red archetype is largely built around that, so this costing one will definitely happen. How good is one red mana for threatening something? Well, I think it's at least a C+. Worth noting, too, that Menace combos quite well with threaten effects in general, since taking away one blocker is even bigger than it usually is when you have Menace going. And in this format, there are also some attractive sacrifice outlets, something that is always desirable in a situation where you temporarily steal a creature. So it won't always cost one red, but I think this does enough that it gets to be a solid playable for most red decks, giving it a C. Next, it's Unpredictable Cyclone, which for three generic and two red is a rare enchantment. And it says, if a cycling ability of another non-land card would cause you to draw a card, Instead, exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a card that shares a card type with the cycled card. You may cast that card without paying its mana cost, then put the exiled cards that weren't cast this way on the bottom of your library in a random order. It also has cycling for two. This card might seem like Red's usual horrible and limited, unpredictable chaos card with a massive confusing text box, but I think this one's actually good. It replaces you drawing a card with cycling to you always hitting a spell with cycling, at least assuming you cycle the spell, and generally you'll also be getting a discount on that spell, since cycling costs between one and three mana in this set. So basically, this gives you super cycling, and it is a very real upgrade. The fact that it has cycling too is nice, because if you get this and have no ways to take advantage of it, or it's too late in the game for you to do anything with it, 
or you need to hit a third land early, you can get rid of it. This thing is certainly unpredictable, in the sense that you won't usually know what you're going to get out of it, but most of the time, whatever you get is going to be worth it. Now, I do think a build-around grade is necessary here, because a deck that just has like 3-5 to five cards with cycling is not going to be wanting to run this. I think you need a true critical mass of cards with cycling for this to do its thing, and that probably means 8 or more. This is probably like a D- in a typical deck in the format, but I think it has a ceiling of a B, and that may even be conservative. I know I'm going to be tempted to take this early, just because it seems powerful and like a lot of fun. Next up, it's Weaponize the Monsters, which for one red mana is an uncommon enchantment. You can pay two and sack a creature, and Weaponize the Monsters deals two damage to any target. The name here is really weird, but I think the card seems like a pretty nice build-around. It's interesting how many build-arounds seem to be in red this time around. Anyway, Repeatable Shock is always very powerful and limited, but many decks won't really have the necessary fodder to really abuse this, and as a result, this is probably not better than a D in your typical deck in this format. Now, it does provide any aggro deck with some reach, and for that reason, I don't think it's a straight-up F in a typical deck. However, in a deck with lots of tokens, this is going to be a nightmare for your opponent, as it will allow you to get small blockers out of the way without giving up much, or help you do the last 6 or 8 damage to your opponent. So I think this is a powerful build around, one that pairs really well with the Threaten effect we saw earlier too. I think this may have a ceiling as high as a B- in a deck that can really use it. And our last red card is Yidaro, Wandering Monster, who for 5 generic and 2 red is an 8-8 legendary dinosaur turtle. Never thought I'd see those creature types together. He's rare, he has trample and haste, he has cycling for 1 generic and a red, and when you cycle him... You shuffle it into your library from your graveyard. If you've cycled a card named Yidaro Wandering Monster four more times this game, put it onto the battlefield from your graveyard instead. This has a really fun design. So, one thing that is kind of sad when you cycle away a big creature you can't play early is that sometimes you get to the late game, and that creature would have been nice to have in your deck. Well, Yidaro fixes that for you. You can cycle it away early to hit a land drop or whatever, and then you have a chance to draw him again later. Sometimes you'll just want to cast him at that point, since he has haste, trample, and a massive body. But other times you still want to have the mana, but you can cycle him again. Cycling him the four times probably won't come up a ton in limited, but hey, it isn't impossible either, so where does he fall? Is he a bomb? I think he is. The fact he gives you nice value no matter when you draw him and then turns into a win condition in the later part of the game is just awesome. I'm giving him an A-. Well, those are all the red cards in Akoria Lair of Behemoths. I'll be back tomorrow to talk about all the green cards in the set. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future uh, set reviews and more limited content of Akoria, don't forget to subscribe. If you disagree with me about anything in this video, let me know in the comments. And again, tomorrow I'll be back with my limited review for green. Thanks for watching.